by recognizing Jerusalem and moving our embassy there, uh, our country is saying what we know from history and the Bible, that Jerusalem has actually been the capital of Jerusalem for 3,000, or capital of Israel, of Israel for 3,000 years. And here's why that is so significant. That historical truth that Jerusalem has been the capital for 3,000 years absolutely explodes the myth that comes from the left that somehow the Jewish people just came into that land 70 years ago and they took it away from the Palestinians and that the Jews have no rightful claim to it. The Bible says and history confirms that God gave that land to the Jewish people and I believe as Genesis 12 says, God blesses those countries that bless Israel and he curses those countries countries that curse Israel. I believe President Trump and the United States are not only on the right side of history in this decision, they're on the right side of God. And here it is, the Balfour Declaration. What do you feel when you, when you see it here? I genuinely feel it's one of the most extraordinary moments in the history of the Jewish people. If you think it took 3,000 years uh, to get to this, and then you say, how did this miracle happen? It's the most incredible piece of opportunism. I mean, if you think you had an impoverished uh, would-be scientist, Heim Weizmann, who somehow gets to England, meets a few people, including members of my family, seduces them, he has such great charm and conviction. He gets to Balfour, and he unbelievably persuades Balfour and Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, and most of the ministers, that this idea of um, the national home for um, Jews should be allowed to take place. I mean, it's so, so unlikely. You come back to the big point, which is that this is perhaps the greatest event in Jewish life for thousands of years. And um, it's a miracle that it took place. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today, once again, by the grace of God, in collaboration with my brother in Christ, Tom Fress, from Inquisition Update, all over the big and far ocean, seen from here in Europe to the United States of America. I'm very glad that we have the possibility to already have made 70, or better said 69, because this is the 70th study of this wonderful um, subject to expose futurism again and again and again. And so some people will probably say, well, you've done enough. I understand it now. Let's leave it. No, you maybe understood it, but many other didn't understand it. And everybody here and there comes new people to a broadcast and hear things like this for the first time. And they come with questions. And since the lie is repeated numerous times in the world, we cannot repeat the truth often enough. It is, as Tom manifested uh, this saying, the biggest deception or the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. And I couldn't agree anymore. Because in the Garden of Eden, because of the deception, the serpent told the woman the eternal life and grace was taken away from man that God gave them. And with futurism, the serpent tries again the same to all living people in this world by taking away their understanding who is the Christ and who is the Antichrist. And that's why this subject is of the utmost importance. I cannot stretch that enough and surely Tom cannot with all his experience teaching this uh, subject for more than 50 years now. And we are today here in the 70th um, part of the study that started with the book of Steve Wahlberg, End Time Delusions. Then we came into the last chapter of that book, which is published on an own book called Exploding the Israel Deception. And we are going to 
go through all of that book and we are even going to go beyond but that's something then from when the study is done so for now after this little inauguration please welcome warmly tom fress from inquisition update to the broadcast yes. thanks for having me york it's my pleasure blessing and privilege to be here and uh, and uh, no long introductions this this afternoon no, i'm ready to get right into the reading yeah, I did the long introduction already. So here we go. We finished off last time on page 14 on the PDF that I made by just copying Matthew Henry's commentary out of the ESORT into a uh, into an own uh, little document that I then worked on a little bit. And uh, we read here that, and this is a repetition because we actually should start on the top of page 15, but for continuity sakes, I like to go back a little bit to fresh up our memory what it was all about here. Matthew Henry says he came up to seal up the vision and prophecy. Of, of course, we don't have any questions who he is in this regard, right? It's our Lord and Messiah, Jesus Christ. All the, prophetic, all the prophetical visions of the Old Testament, which had reference to the Messiah, he sealed them up. That is, he accomplished them. Now, when you accomplish something, it is sealed up. That's what this says. He answered to them, he answered to them to a tittle. All things that were written in the law, the prophets and the Psalms concerning the Messiah were fulfilled in him. He accomplished them, he fulfilled them and he sealed them all up. Thus, he confirmed the truth of them as well as his own mission. He sealed them up. That is, he put an end to that method of God's discovering his mind and will and took another course by completing the scripture canon in the New Testament, which is the more sure word of prophecy than that by vision. As we can read in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, quote, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do, dwell, ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. And in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 we read God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Unquote. He came to anoint the most holy, that is, himself. He is the holy one who was anointed, that is, appointed to his work and qualified for it by the Holy Ghost, that oil of gladness which he received without measure above his fellows, or to anoint the gospel church, his spiritual temple or holy place, to sanctify and cleanse it and appropriate it to himself. As we read in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, quote, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Unquote. Or to consecrate for us a new and living way into the holiest by his own blood. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 20. By a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. As the sanctuary was anointed, as we read in Exodus chapter 30 verse 25, where it says, quote, and thou shalt make it an oil of holy ointment, an ointment compound after the art of the apothecary. It shall be an holy anointing oil. Unquote. He is called Messiah, as we can read in Daniel chapter 9, verses 25 and 26, which signifies Christ, anointed, as we can read in John chapter 1, verse 41, quote, He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted, the Christ, because he received the unction both for himself and for all that are his. I think I have to take a little break here and let Tom comment on the red two pages. Certainly, uh, you're seeing from the black and white language of the New Testament words taken directly from Daniel's prophecy the 70th week 
the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy, as recorded in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. And uh, that's, what the, that's what the whole purpose of the New Testament is, to absolutely prove beyond any question that Daniel's prophecy was fulfilled for perfectly and completely by Messiah the Prince. And the New Testament is the historical record of it. The divinely inspired, infallible historical record of the perfect and complete fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week by Messiah the Prince, Jesus, the one who was anointed and the one who made a covenant with many for one week, seven years of time. And in the midst of the week, he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease by becoming the sacrifice himself, thus putting an end to all sacrifices and oblations from that point on. All the previous sacrifices and oblations, Temple Mount, uh, Temple Mount worship, was to look was simply looking forward prophetically to Christ. But when he came, there was no more need for sacrifices and oblations because he became the sacrifice, the only sacrifice that can take away sin. And uh, it is finished. And uh, uh, to say, it, it, you know, the more and more you listen, the more and more you begin to understand for anybody to say that the 70th week of Daniel's future is absurd. For anyone to say that anyone other than Messiah the Prince is to fulfill that prophecy, like is taught in all the churches that the Antichrist is going to fulfill them, is more than absurd. It's an abominable lie. It's a damnable lie. And it confuses, as it is intended to do, the identity of Christ and Antichrist, to confuse the two. That's the whole purpose of it, to deny that Jesus was the Christ and to make a future antichrist to fulfill it and then proclaim himself to be the Christ. That's what, the, that's what this, this is all about. That's what the, the entire ecumenical movement is all about. And that false Christ is going to be the papacy. And as, as, as hard as that is for people to uh, believe and teach or, or to believe, Simply keep listening, and we'll make it all believable. We'll make it undeniable. Back to you, Yerk. Well, in my understanding, Tom, it's even hard to understand how people can question um, that Daniel chapter 9 deals with Jesus Christ, because in the beginning it is said, um, in Daniel chapter uh, 9, verse 24, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and thy holy city. So it's all about the Jews. It's all about the true Israelites. That has nothing to do with the Antichrist in the very first place. Right. It, it deals in no way in, in, uh, and nowhere in the whole prophecy any, uh, with anything that has to do with Rome yeah. or an Antichrist or whatsoever. It deals yep. with the Jews and the Jews only. And a Jew came to save, save them because Jesus Christ was, was from Jewish descendants. Right. So it's all about Jews. I, I don't even understand how when you start reading that, how you can put Antichrist, how you can put anything out of the Jewish mm -hmm. realm in there. Yeah. Yep. And I also want to mention how perfectly wonderful it is the language that uh, Matthew Henry uses to describe uh, this vision, to sealing up the vision and the prophecy by performing it. That's how he sealed it up. And, and, and who seals up uh, anything? It's the king who puts his seal on, uh, uh, on something that is official. Okay, The king puts his seal on it. That's his seal of approval. And, and it's just like when the king reads a proclamation uh, to the nation. And after reading this proclamation, the king has spoken. The final authority has now uttered his approval or disapproval of a certain thing. 
And then when he rolls up the scroll, he places his seal upon it. That means if the Pope or if, if the king's seal is on a document, that means the king himself sealed it. And it's not to be unsealed by anyone but the king. Now, if Jesus sealed up the vision and the prophecy, that is Daniel's 70th week, it is finished, and he sealed up the vision and the prophecy. He put his seal on it. No one has authority to open that seal. No one has authority to remove the seal and to change the content of the vision and the prophecy. And to do so is a capital offense. When the king seals a document, it's sealed, and it's not to be opened by anyone but the king or one of his assigns. But what has the Christian world done today? The apostate Christian world thinks itself so wise that they can take that vision and that prophecy that Christ sealed up 2,000 years ago and reopen that without permission and to rewrite it and to say that it hasn't even been fulfilled yet and it's going to be fulfilled in the future and it's not going to be Messiah the Prince that's going to do it. It's not going to be the most holy that's going to be anointed. It's going to be the Antichrist. Now, that's what's believed and taught in all the churches. They have unlawfully unsealed a document that has been sealed by the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And that not only have they broken the seal illegally, they've changed the content of the document. They've, re they've rewritten the vision and the prophecy. And they've cast its fulfillment off to the end of time. These are all capital offenses. I want the listeners to understand what we're talking about. Messiah the Prince fulfilled the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. Messiah the Prince. And when he sealed up the vision and the prophecy, Daniel's 70th week, what but a deceiver would unseal that vision and that prophecy, which secures our salvation, and then rewrite it and cast it to the end of time and then say the Antichrist is going to fulfill it. Listen, you can't get more jacked up than that. You, you you talk about messed up. I can't I don't I can't even formulate words to describe what a horror and what a consequential horror it is to break the seal on the seventieth week of Daniel and then rewrite the whole vision and the prophecy, cast it to the end of time, and then take it away from Messiah the Prince and give it to the Antichrist. That's what the churches do. Every single one of them. You can't find a historicist church in this country or anywhere else in the world. And if there's a church struggling to teach the historicist truth, they have to be underground practically. Everybody wants to believe the lie. They 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 maketh and they loveth the lie. So God send them strong delusion, because they love not the truth. How do you express your hatred for the truth? To say that it hasn't happened yet. When the truth happened 2,000 years ago, you deny that Jesus was the Christ. You deny that Jesus was the most holy. You deny that he is the one who made the covenant with many for one week. You deny that he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. You deny his messianic role when you say the 70th week of Daniel is yet future. You can't find a more perfect way to deny Jesus as the Messiah than to be a futurist. Let that sink in. 
And then you'll understand why I tell everybody, get out of the churches while the getting is good. It's the worst place in the world for God's people in the churches today. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. In order to all this, the Messiah must be cut off, must die a violent death, and so be cut off from the land of the living, as was foretold in Isaiah 53, verse 8, quote, He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut, out, cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. What people are we talking about here? Daniel's people. Exactly, Tom. The, the, same, the same people that are mentioned in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Exactly. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and thy holy city. Those people, for the transgression of their people, was he stricken. Because Jesus Christ came to save the Jews first. That's why we know that the 70th week of Daniel is over, because today not only the Jews know that Jesus came, not only the Jews are saved, but also the Gentiles who believe in, in him and profess him. Without Jesus Christ having come 2,000 years ago and went to the cross, we Gentiles wouldn't have had any salvation yet. So for the transgression of the Jews was he stricken. The Jews are the ones that he made a covenant with. He made a covenant with many with all the people that believed in him in that time. With the others, he didn't. It says, for as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. There's your many. To as many as received him. Okay, he gave a covenant to many for one week. And the Bible says who the many are. To as many as received him, gave he the power to become the sons of God. It says so right in the New Testament. The historical record of the perfect and complete fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. All the language is there. It cannot be denied. And, and once this is seen by the listeners, you cannot continue to, to remain a futurist. You can't have it both ways. Either the 70th week of Daniel is fulfilled, or it's not. And the New Testament leaves you no choice. It is fulfilled. So are you going to deny the New Testament? The historical record of, of, of Messiah's seven-year ministry in this world? And are you going to take that seven years and throw it to the end of time and then give it to the Antichrist to fulfill? Oh, but that's what's taught in all the churches. As absolutely ridiculous, as abominable as that teaching is, it is now the orthodox teaching in all the Protestant and evangelical belly churches. Protestant in name only, apostate Christianity. You call it whatever it is, but you cannot call it the truth. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Hence... When Paul preaches the death of Christ, he says that he preached nothing but what the prophet said should come, as we can read in Acts chapter 26, verse 22 and 23, where the Bible says, quote, Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles." Unquote. And thus it behooved Christ to suffer. He must be cut off, but not for himself, not for any sin of his own, but, as Caiaphas prophesied, he must die for the people in our stead and for our good, not for any advantage of his own. The glory he purchased for himself was no more than the glory he had before, as we can read in John chapter 17, verse 4 and 5, quote, 
I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Unquote. No, it was to atone for our sins and to purchase life for us that he was cut off. And why do we have to purchase life? Because the very first two men that were created by God, man and woman, threw it away. And it had to be rebought. There had to be a price being paid, and the price was blood. And throughout the ages, it was the blood of innocent animals that could never take away the sin of man, until the one and only man came who never knew sin and went to the cross and died for all of us. And with the shedding of his blood, he paid the price. He purchased, purchased life for us because he was cut off and not for himself. He must confirm the covenant with many. He shall introduce a new covenant between God and man, a covenant of grace, since it had become impossible for us to be saved by a covenant of innocence. This covenant he shall confirm by his doctrine and miracles, by his death and resurrection, by the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper. <laughs> Interesting, Tom. Um, just in the uh, premiere that is that was just running, that was the recording we did last week, um, it was spoken about the quote-unquote sacraments and uh, it was mentioned the word ordinances, uh, that baptism and the Lord's Supper or communion are ordinances. Interesting to find exactly these words now in Matthew Henry's explanation of Daniel chapter 9, don't you think, Tom? Yes, I don't think it's coincidence at all. I mean, no, it's, I mean, it's no whole, coincidence. The whole, the whole object of reading Matthew Henry's commentary is to prove that prior to this abomination called futurism and its advent into the churches through the Protestant and Evangelical seminaries of England about 1810 A.D., the, 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 the commentaries were all future, or, or all, were all historicist in their, in their comments. They understand that the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled perfectly and completely by Jesus 2,000 years ago. And we've given the listeners proof of that fact. And they can verify this themselves by reading other commentary from people prior to that period of time and see for themselves. And uh, uh, all, all of history is going to bear witness to the, the correctness of historicism and the error of futurism. Uh, when, when a person begins a study before long, you come to the conclusion that it's a wonder anyone who ever called himself a Christian ever believed in futurism. It is that ridiculous. But all the churches teach it, all of them. One form or other, they all teach futurism. And there's a reason to deceive God's people. And uh, just where you would think that Satan would do his most damage, that's where you find him. Right behind the pulpits of all the Protestant and evangelical churches. And who put him there? Satan and the vicar of Satan in Rome. The Antichrist. The historical, the biblical, and the prophetic Antichrist. The Pope of Rome who came to power right after the restrainer was taken out of the way, the Roman Caesars. The Roman Empire just morphed from the pagan Roman Empire to the papal Roman Empire, and it still rules and reigns today. And it still deceives the whole world. The whole world is drunk with the wine. That is the false teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. And that wine is called futurism and we've got to spit it up and go back to true biblical historical 
Christianity or suffer the consequences, and the consequences are indescribable. We're suffering them now, and it's only going to get worse. Back to you, Yerk. I think, Tom, when you just said uh, it is taught everywhere in all the churches, this futurism, and that is why people gobble it up and believe it, I think this is something that you can um, say over the whole world today. Whatever belief system or quote-unquote truth is taught out there in the world, the majority believes it. Just, right. just look at the, at the times that we are living right now where they tell all the people that there's a virus going around, knocking on everybody's door, knocking a few people down, and um, everybody gets infected, and therefore they are um, doomed to death in this life, which we are all anyway, and everybody believes it. People just don't ask questions anymore. They don't ask questions about this agenda that is running the world since uh, the beginning of last year, in 2020. And they don't ask any questions about the real biblical uh, meaning of prophecy. They just don't question authority. I, I think that is the biggest problem that we have in all the world, Tom. That people well, they work just don't ask uh, question authority anymore. And they accept authority that is whether usurped or made self-made authority, because that's the only authority the Pope has. The world believes and worships and obeys the wrong authority in this world. That's the papacy. And you yeah, see that yeah. in the churches by everybody following futurism. Yep. And you see that outside of the churches by everybody following the agenda that is put out there with this health crisis that the we are faced with since last year. And political yep. crisis. Yeah. That's the political agenda. Yep. And there's a religious agenda and a political agenda. And, and those two include the health agenda the energy agenda, the global warming agenda, and every other agenda. They, it, they they, 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 it encompasses the financial agenda of this, of this world, to break it financially, so that it uh, uh, begs for a financier. And who is that going to be? The new global power. And, uh, you know, as ridiculous as it sounds to most of the people who are listening, it's the papacy. It's, it's the papacy. <laughs> I, I have years and years and years of experience of people say, oh, come on, Tom. The papacy? A doddering old fool in a little bitty town in the central part of Rome. Uh, the 108 acres, you tell me the Pope has that much power. Uh-huh. That's exactly what I'm telling you. And, and you wouldn't argue with me. You wouldn't even laugh at me. You would take me nothing but seriously if you had a clue of anything of history. Now, Yerk's got a clue of history. And he can tell you how the European emperors went to Rome to get their orders. The kings of Europe were dominated by the papacy. They didn't come to power without the papacy's help. They didn't maintain their thrones or their heads without the papacy's help. And th that's no laughing matter to somebody like Yerk or anybody else that's familiar with European history. It's only we in the new world, the so-called new world, who are ignorant of history. And we've been kept ignorant of history. But isn't it funny? Before futurism took over the churches, the churches were truly Protestant. They protested the Antichrist of the Roman Catholic Church. They protested the papacy that reigned and ruled over the kings of the earth, that made us all vassals of the Roman pontiff, the man of sin, the son of perdition. All you got to do is roll back the history book about 500 years and read true Christian history, and your eyes will be opened. Both Yerk and I have done this. We've rolled back the historical clock 500 years and read the history books. We've read the commentary from the Christian uh, commentators 
and and we've read we read church history by true authentic historians bound by conscience to tell the truth and everybody knew who the antichrist was 500 years you could walk up to any christian a true christian a bible believing christian and ask him who the antichrist they'd look at you like well, did you, just, did you just fall off a turnip truck? You don't know who the Antichrist is? Are you kidding me? It's the Pope of Rome. And the local bishop ruled. The local bishop ruled the civil government in that locality, wherever, the, wherever you were. In whatever diocese you dwelt, the bishop of the diocese ruled over the governors, ruled over the mayors, ruled over the congressmen, ruled over the senators, ruled over the courts. The most powerful man in any diocese is the local Roman Catholic bishop. They oversaw the civil power, and the civil power was required to obey the bishop. And it's just that same way here in the United States today. It's exactly the same as it was then. You're just not allowed to know about it. Well, now you know about it, and you, you have no excuse to remain ignorant. Yes, the papacy is that powerful, and his power is expressed in every diocese, every Roman Catholic jurisdiction in this country that covers this country from coast to coast and from border to border. That This country is all laid out in dioceses. And the head of each Roman Catholic diocese is the Roman Catholic bishop. And he answers to no one but the Pope. And when he walks into any, any political office of power in this country, he is the authority. Whether he walks into the courthouse, whether he walks into the bank, whether he walks into the White House or the state capitol, he rules the roost. And if you want to deceive yourself and say he doesn't, you go right ahead, but at your own peril. Back to you, York. I'm just trying to look up the pictures of the American dioceses to give people an idea what it looks like, but the pictures are also small. Here, this is the biggest one that I can find for the moment. Maps of diocesan boundaries in the United States of America. No, this is um, of a size that we can understand. And this is something we spoke about um, in earlier broadcasts, of course. This is what they call the quote-unquote shadow government. Yeah? That's right. And, exactly uh, right. And every city, a city is a city because a uh, bishop sits there. Yeah? Um, that's why it's called a city. That's another kind of research everybody can and should do. And yeah, that, that's why the people follow uh, the people in quote unquote authority. I think uh, one more point that I wanted to make is um, in the beginning uh, of Rome, because you were just speaking about how Rome morphed from the, uh, from the uh, pagan uh, empire to the papal empire, uh, which then happened in the fifth century, at the end of the fifth century. And the interesting point is that in the beginning, the emperor of the Roman uh, Empire crowned the Pope, the Bishop of Bishops in the time. And it just took a few hundred years for the Pope to turn that around. And then the Pope crowned the emperors, starting with Charlemagne in 800 AD on the 25th of December, for crying out loud of all dates that <laughs> they could have chosen. The interesting point in that is that, again, this is a fulfilling of prophecy because the Antichrist sells good for bad and bad for good. He turns everything 180 degrees around. When it was historically that the emperor crowned the bishop of bishops, a few hundred years later, when the papacy rose in power, all of a sudden the bishop of bishops crowned the emperor. And that's another very distinct point in history when you of course know and study real true history 
where you can see the fulfillment of it. That he thinks to change times and laws. Isn't it a law that an emperor is above a priest and that the emperor should anoint the priest and not the other way around? Well, think about that for some time if you go and study real history, which is absolutely important when you follow our readings. And we give you advice where you can study real history through the books Tom and I read. Tom read many more books than I did. I only read <laughs> a tiny little percentage of what he read. But the point is that in those readings, you will get a real understanding of real history. And when you understand the real history, you can also understand historicism. And that's what it's all about, because when you understand historicism, you can expose futurism for what it is. And that's the purpose of all this study and the work that Tom and I are doing here, by the grace of the Lord. Just one of the great, one of the great horrors of futurism is it blinds people to who the Antichrist is. And that's the point, the original point we, we intended to make. Futurism blinds every Christian as to the true identity of the Antichrist. Because futurism says the Antichrist doesn't rear his ugly diabolical head until just seven years before Christ returns. So he's not in the world today, is he? But the fact of the matter is the papacy, the Antichrist of scripture, history, and prophecy has been the dominant figure throughout the church age. It has dominated the church age. It has dominated the churches. It has dominated the politics. And it is, as, as it were, the God of this world. And you should not be ignorant of that, but you are because you're a futurist. Now, do you understand what a horror futurism is? How are you going to pray against Antichrist? How are you going to protect yourself and your family from the Antichrist if you don't even know who he is? That's the victory of Satan over the church, to deny us the ability to see the Antichrist in the papacy. But look, I want to remind you, even again, after saying this, for most of the Christian era, up until about 1800 AD, God's people knew for a certainty who the Antichrist was. They weren't looking for a future Antichrist. They knew about the historical Antichrist, the one who had ruled and reigned over the kings of the earth and persecuted God's people, tortured God's people, put them to death, burnt them at the stake for most of the Christian era. To tell them that the papacy is not the Antichrist would probably be lucky to receive just cynical laughter and uh, at worst, a brisk slap across the face. Uh, look, if you exonerate the papacy, then you do a disservice to all the martyrs of Jesus over the past 2,000 years because they died at the hands of the papacy and the kings over which he ruled. That's all the kings over which he ruled. They together killed the prophets and the saints of Almighty God. All the saints were murdered massacred, tortured, burned at the stake by the Pope and his kings. And to exonerate the papacy of the blame of Antichrist as do the futurists, without exception, is the greatest of assaults against the precious saints of Almighty God, the martyrs of Jesus. And their blood is going to be avenged and who's a vengeance? Who will be? Uh, who will that vengeance come upon? 
by those who worship the Antichrist. They worship and obey the Antichrist, the one who killed the saints of Almighty, the one who killed the martyrs of Jesus. And every Christian in this world is poised to have that vengeance wreaked upon them. Their blood, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, will be found upon their heads. Every futurist stands to receive the vengeance of the martyrs of Jesus. You think I'm exaggerating? You think this is melodrama? You wait till it unfolds before your very eyes. Nobody will be able to, who, to deny it. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. He must confirm the covenant with many. He shall introduce a new covenant between God and man, a covenant of grace, since it had become impossible for us to be saved by a covenant of innocence. This covenant he shall confirm by his doctrine and miracles, by his death and resurrection, by the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper which are no sacraments, but which are ordinances, which are the seals of the New Testament, assuring us that God is willing to accept us upon gospel terms. His death made this testament of force, and <clears throat> his death made his testament of force and enabled us to claim what is bequeathed by it. He confirmed it to the many, to the common people, the poor were evangelized when the rulers and Pharisees believed not on him. Or he confirmed it with many with the Gentile world. The New Testament was not, like the old, confined to the Jewish church, but was committed to all nations. Christ gave his life a ransom for many. And that, of course, is true what Matthew Henry says, but I think many people will now misunderstand it a little bit because earlier I said the covenant with many uh, that was made refers to the Jews because Daniel chapter 9 only refers to the Jews and their holy city. Of course, but after the resurrection, that covenant was spread all over the world. The gospel was spread all over the world. The apostles went all over the world and they spread the gospel to all the nations and also in the nations where many people found who believed on God. And we first see that in chapter, if I'm not mistaken, chapter 8 of the book of Acts when Philip goes down with the eunuch who is a um, a, a eunuch of Cassandra, the uh, queen of the Ethiopians in that time, and baptizes him after he says, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That was the first, after the stoning of Stephen, Gentile, who was welcomed in the kingdom of Christ. And he was one of many because not all the Gentiles embrace Christ, as we know today. The true Bible-believing, Jesus-following Christians are just a handful out of the more than 7 billion people roaming the earth for the moment. So it's many, but it's not the majority. Yeah? So when Matthew Henry writes this here, he confirmed it with many with the Gentile world, yeah, that's for later on. He confirmed it first with the Jews. That's at least my understanding. The point is here that we do not take every word that Matthew Henry writes for granted. We also have to point out here and there maybe a little mistake. Yeah? That's what I see here in this regard. Because he confirmed it with many, the Jews that believed on him in the time, but then after his resurrection and after the stoning of Stephen when the 70th week of Daniel was completely over then it was committed to all nations and Christ gave his ransom uh, his life ransom for many then including the Gentiles but not in the first place 
Do you want to comment on that, what I just said here, Tom? No, the, the scriptures verify that. Jesus' command was, was explicit. Go not unto the way of the Gentiles. Their time had not yet come. Okay? Uh, uh, strangely, even then, uh, it was obvious uh, that the Jews knew not the time of their visitation. They were taken by surprise that Messiah was among them. Why? Because they didn't understand Daniel's prophecy. The same prophecy that we're confused and confounded about today. Had they known Daniel's prophecy, the 70-week prophecy, they'd have been looking for him. Every Jew in Jerusalem would have been, you know, down at the River Jordan, welcoming, heralding their Messiah. But they knew not the time of their visitation because they didn't study Daniel's prophecy. They didn't make a red X on the calendar 483 years after the going forth, the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. That's 69 weeks. Well, that's 483 literal years. All you got to do is wait for that decree, mark it down, and count ahead 483 years, put a red X on the calendar. That's when every Jew in Jerusalem should have been waiting for him. That's when the, the you know, they should have heralded him, Hosanna, King of the Jews. They knew not the time of their visitation. Matter of fact, they put him to death. He challenged the Jewish authorities at the time. And uh, but the same prophecy that they were confused about 2,000 years ago, they're completely confused about today. The Gentiles are just as confused as were the Jews 2,000 years ago. Now, the consequence for the Jews were they missed their Messiah and they put him to death. What do you suppose the consequences could be to the Gentiles in our generation? I'll tell you what it is. You're not going to like it one bit. You will all be found worshiping a false Messiah when Jesus comes. That's the consequence. Why? Because you don't know who the Antichrist is. You believe the Antichrist is future. He's not yet in the world by your teaching and your understanding. But the fact of the matter is, he's already in the world, has been in the world throughout the entire Christian era. And the laws that you obey... The authority that you obey is papal. We're already made subjects of the Holy Roman Pontiff. And obedience is the highest form of worship, isn't it? That's exactly right. The most pristine form of worship there is of any God is to obey his laws. And that's the law that we obey. We're forced to obey on penalty of even death if the infraction is serious enough. But but it's just easier to believe the lie, isn't it? And that's why so few people come to the knowledge of the truth. Easier because or they more love comfortable. The lie. Easier or more right. comfortable, Tom. Right. They they love the lie. They've made the lie so lovable and the truth so hideous. But if you, uh, if you love the Lord Jesus, you give up futurism, believe historicism, and tell others who the Antichrist is and how we are dominated every moment of our lives by the man of sin, the son of perdition in Rome, and how much our government worships, serves, and obeys him and makes us all his subjects just like it's always been, all throughout the Christian era. And the only ones who wouldn't bend the knee to the papal, uh, the, the papal Nebuchadnezzar, they were all killed. They are the martyrs of Jesus. And history records even their names. Read it in Fox's Book of Martyrs. The reality is hideous, but it's the truth. 
and you cannot deny it. You can deceive yourself with a false hope, but it will be no hope at all for you. Better to come to the truth and repent of the futurist error and, and, and do away with the great delusion that has overcome the churches. Make a difference for yourself and your family and those who are in your company of friends. And let the truth of historicism ring throughout this land and pitch the papal antichrist out of this country. In Jesus' name. Back to you, Yerk. I already have a thought since... 15, 20 minutes since I'm here and I'm, I was just thinking about how, how I can put that thought best into words, Tom. And I think I want to do that and then uh, close the broadcast with your final comment on what I have to say right now. If you want to understand the difference between historicism and futurism, you have to understand the difference between Protestantism and anti-Protestantism or counter-Protestantism. Protestantism as historicism is built on two pillars. Jesus is the Christ is pillar one, and the papacy is the Antichrist is pillar two. Now, when Protestantism is turned upside down, Jesus is not the Christ anymore, and the papacy is not the Antichrist anymore. In historicism, it is the same thing. Historicism proves by fulfilled prophecy, by the prophecies fulfilled by Jesus Christ, by the way, this example, Daniel chapter 9, that Jesus was and is the Christ. He, you know, he's the God of the living. He still is. He is alive. He is not with us here, but he is alive. My God is alive. And the other pillar is that the papacy is the Antichrist. So whenever you come across a teaching that the papacy is not the Antichrist, you know that you come against a teaching that is against historicism, that is against Protestantism, and that is against the Bible. It is the quote-unquote counter-reformation. You can also put reformation in the same, um, for, in, in the same uh, formula. You can say Protestantism, Reformation, and historicism are all built on the pillars that Jesus is the Christ and the papacy is the Antichrist. And futurism and all the other lies of the papacy and the world that we live in today are all built on that Jesus is not the Christ and the papacy is not the Antichrist. Nobody in futurism is taught that the papacy is the Antichrist. And with denying Daniel chapter 9, they teach you that Jesus is not the Christ. Do you really need more proof how wicked this world is for the moment? Please, Tom. How, how wicked the churches are at this moment? You want me to comment on that? Uh, York, the only thing I could do is just reiterate everything you just said. That's the only comment I could have. So I'll just leave it alone. And when the, when the listeners listen to this broadcast, they can rewind to the beginning of where you began your speech, your closing comments, and listen to it over and over and over. Perfect witness to the truth. I, can, I couldn't add a thing. Thank you, Virk. Appreciate it. Today, it is infinitely easier to kill a million people than to control a million people. It is easier to kill than to control. We're, we're, we're at the very beginning stages of a very brutal and bloody conflict. Um, and I believe that um, we've come horribly off track uh, in the years uh, since the fall of the Soviet Union. And we're starting uh, now in the 21st century, which I believe strongly is a crisis both of our church, a crisis of our faith, a crisis of the West, and a crisis of capitalism. His son Jesus is here in our midst. His bride, the church, is honored to host an event affirming the dignity of the human person, and the sacredness of all human life. I think Russia is no longer a communist state, first of all. That's very important to realize. It hasn't yet defined itself, however, effectively as a democracy. It is still uncertain. We're at the very beginning stages of a very brutal and bloody conflict. 
of which if the people in this room and the people in the church do not bind together and really form what I feel is an aspect of the church militant, if the people in this room and the people in the church do not bind together and really form what I feel is an aspect of the church militant, the church militant, to really be able to not just stand with our beliefs, but to fight for our beliefs against this new barbarity that's starting, uh, that we will literally eradicate everything that we've been bequeathed over the last uh, 2,500 years. You didn't mention the president by name, but it was hard not to conclude that that's who you were referring to. Is that fair? I was certainly referring to the threats that we are now facing you know, with this stated goals of this administration, which would upset the last 70 years of a new world order which was established after World War II. 70 years based on human rights, respect for the law, uh, free trade, all of the things and aspects of this world order that took place after one of the most horrific, uh, terrible wars in history, and I'm for maintaining it. We are grateful to be citizens of one nation under God who acclaim this evening that in God we trust. Bless our two candidates, our benefactors, and those whom the L. Smith Foundation has been honored to serve for seven decades. Guide us safely home, both this evening and for all eternity, through Christ our Lord. Amen.